Hello, friends. This is Timothy L. Price with the Kingdom Citizenship Podcast. And today we have a very special interview that was pre recorded. So it's going to be a little bit different approach than our normal podcast. In this episode, we are going to have Roland and Sandra Miller from Mississippi to talk to us about a story about being broken into, their house being broken into, and seeing God's deliverance. I thought this was amazing because I heard it online and I went down to Mississippi to interview with them. And it's before I really got started with the podcast thing, so I really didn't have the format worked out. The sound quality is not exactly as good as it is with the microphone here, but I hope you'll overlook that and listen to the story and listen to what they had to say because it really uh, brings glory to God. So with a little more ado, uh, please like, subscribe, comment, and share this with your friends. So here we go. What I want you to do is introduce yourself. Who are you and where are you from? Okay, my name is Sandra Miller, and I'm from Macon, Mississippi. Okay, and this is? I'm Rollin Miller, and of course, we're from Macon, Mississippi, too. Oh, I see. Okay, so your story goes back a little ways about the break-in. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, we were in bed sleeping. We had earlier been to the church for a cell group meeting, and we had come home, and we were tired. And we were, the last I looked at the time, it was 11-11, and we were sound asleep in our bedroom. And I woke up. There's a face in front of me, probably about six inches, and it was a man. It was a black, I knew it was a black fellow. And he did not belong there. <laughs> and shortly, and he was right beside me. And he woke up too. And so he started kicking him off the bed. He went into protectionist mode and I went into defensive mode. Because he was kind of almost on top of me. We were under covers. We had an air conditioner going. So we like to keep our room cool, cold, but get under covers. And uh, so he started battling him. Mm. Okay, now okay. you take it on. He told me if uh, I came here to rape your wife, if you do anything to interfere with what I'm doing, I'm going to kill you. Then he did hit me with something and he knocked me out. And when I come to, I was laying on the floor. And so I don't exactly know how, because I have no way of knowing how I went from the bed to the floor. But I was laying there on the floor and I had my hands on the floor and I started, I felt the floor was wet. It's a wooden floor. And I felt the floor was wet and I knew there was blood there. And I looked up, I started to get up and he looked at me with beady eyes. He said, don't you get up. If you do, I'm going to kill you. And he, I looked, I was beside the bed. He had my wife on the floor, on the foot end of the bed. And. I'll take it from there. Okay, you go on. So after he got him on the floor, he turned his attention to me because he was out of it. Hmm. And he grabbed me and he ripped my clothes off, every last stitch, and he threw me on the floor. And he started to want to do, he wanted to rape me. And I took hold of his genitals so he couldn't do anything. His man parts. Both hands. I used both hands. He couldn't do anything. And he threw me around on the floor. And somewhere in the process of all this, I knew he had a knife. About this long, eight inches maybe. And uh, but for some reason, I didn't like it, but it never occurred to me that I could take it away. 
And so I was there on the floor. He was battling me, and I was hanging on to him so he could do what he wanted to do. And I was getting tired. And one time he took my feet and put them up over my head. Ooh, that hurt. He took his face fist and he beat me on the face, knocked the tooth loose. And, uh, and in the meantime, I was preaching to him. And I said, you need to repent. If you don't, you're going to hell. And I was very passionate and I didn't mince any words. I was passionate and very emotional about And in the meantime, I was also praying out loud that Jesus would help me. Well, then when I was laying there, Rollins started moving over there. And he was momentarily distracted. And in that moment, I was able to take that knife out of his hand. And I put it in a clothes basket that I had right beside me on the floor. And it was full of underwear, short, small pieces, like socks. Normally, I put that stuff away if I get it washed. But that week, I was just so busy and it was just sitting on the floor. And I looked around and where could I hide this stuff thing? So I dug a hole in that wash basket and I hid that knife. See, he gave it. I just took a hold of that knife, and just took it out of his hand and put it in there. In the meantime, he forgot, he didn't seem to know that I took it out of his hand, I guess. He went over there and he warned him, that you stay down there, you leave me alone or else I'm going to kill you. Okay. So he came back and he tried it again. And I took hold of his thing stuff. And would you know, three times, there was this little voice in my head that said, squeeze tighter. Yeah. I thought I was squeezing it tight. I was doing as tight as I could. And I said, okay, I'll try. And that happened three times. And I really wondered what was the Lord doing when he told me to do it. And he knew I was doing it. Oh, hang on as tight as I could. And fast forward a little bit. By the time I was done with my fingers were sore and stiff. But anyways, and I was preaching to him, Tony, if he does not repent, he's going to hell. And anyways, I was preaching to him. Then during this time, Roland and I were talking to each other. We talked in Pennsylvania Dutch, so he won't understand us. <laughs> and I was trying to see if he could come and help me. But well, he couldn't. Because after all, he threatened to kill Roland. And he thought, well, the least he can do is just, just hold still. At least maybe he might survive it. Yeah, but he, Roland could not understand why we were tussling. He couldn't understand what, he, could, he, he couldn't see it. That's why he couldn't see it. He, he was tossing her back and forth, kind of, like a rag doll. I say I was never physically abused in my life that I was then. Well, and what's interesting is when Rolla and I were talking to each other, we could see each other real well. And we didn't think so much about it afterwards. The, the room was dark. The only light in that room, we had two alarm clocks, one on either side there with the LED light. You know, that's... Just, alarm and, clock. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was dark, but Rolla and I could see each other real well. But anyways, when he was fighting me, I was hanging on to him so he couldn't do anything. I opened my eyes and I saw nothing but black. Oh, it was so black. The room. Yes, I mean, he was here in front of me, but it was just black. It was dark. I couldn't see anything. And uh, then I thought, I'm experiencing the powers of darkness. Oh. The Bible says the devil is part of darkness. So I connected the dots. I'm dealing with a demon possessed man. So in the name of Jesus, through his blood, I rebuke this demon. Now, I don't exactly remember the words I said, but I pleaded to Jesus to rebuke this demon through the power, with the power of his blood. I did that three times. And then all of a sudden, the guy relaxed. He got up. I let him go, of course. <laughs> and he went over to Ronald, took hold of his hand, and he picked him up off the floor. 
Wow, that is unthinkable. You know, this sister was had the presence of mind to think about what God was showing her and then to respond is, I don't know, it's pretty brave, pretty crazy, if you ask me. But let's get back to the story here. And he started talking like a sensible person. And he started apologizing to Rollin. Yeah, he started apologizing to me. And he was begging me to give him a second chance before he was wanting to kill me. Now, it appeared like I was supposed to have mercy on him. You know, like I had the power to give him a second chance or not. And I, and he said, uh, he said he just, he just got out of prison. He, sa he said six months ago, but the truth was three months. And, uh, and I said, you got out of prison. Uh, why did you go to prison for to start with? Because I was doing what I'm doing right now. And I could get, he was trying to apologize for what he's doing. And he begged me not to tell the police because he told me a number of times and not to tell the police because tomorrow he has a daughter that's that's going to have a birthday and he won't be able to be there then he'll be he'll put him behind the bars and he won't be there for his daughter's birthday well i said well how many children do you have five do you have a wife yes he's got a wife and then i also was kind of preaching to him and says, you, you need to find the Lord. That's what you need to do. You, you better go find the Lord somewhere. Well, we have to break here for just a couple of moments. So uh, we'll be right back. Hey folks, this is Tim the L. Price with Kingdom Citizenship Podcast. And one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was finding more guests for the, the show. If you have people that you know of that are, have a good testimony or they have a great story or they have good teaching that would help us gain understanding and encouragement, we want to talk to them. So get a hold of us and we would like to put some people on. Talk to you soon. Hey friends, this is Timothy L. Price here. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about how you can be supportive of Kingdom Citizenship by our books. Labyrinth of the World and the Paradise of the Heart is a fantastic book, and we have it in hardbound, we have it in softbound for the budget-minded, and we also have it in a audio book. Now, if you order this from my website, which is labyrinthoftheworld.com, or you can get all three and even an ebook on Amazon. Go and buy the books, get excited, share the books with other people, and be a part of what we're doing here on Kingdom Citizenship. Thanks so much. Okay, we're back again. We're with, uh, in a pre-recorded interview with Sandra and Roland Miller. And I want you again to like, subscribe, comment, and share with your friends. This story is a story that really, again, brings glory to God. So let's get back to it here. So, okay. So I want to ask some questions then. You're from a Mennonite background, correct? Yes. Tell me about the Mennonite background and about how it prepared you or how you differ from it in regard to this subject. <laughs> okay. We, we grew up in the conservative conference. Are you familiar with that? No, not exactly. So, okay. So, for our listeners, you grew up in uh, the conservative conference of what? Conservative Mennonite Conference. Conservative Mennonite. Okay. Yeah, it, that, that was it called Conservative Mennonite Conference. I and think they changed their name recently. They don't go by that name anymore. Yeah, but then, oh, I grew up in in the state of Iowa, and she grew in the state of Indiana. But we both went to churches. That was under the umbrella of the conservative conference through the, through the 50s. The Mennonite, conservative Mennonite. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, conservative Mennonite conference. And uh, we moved to Mississippi, and it was a, 
uh, a new church, a colonization project, starting a church here in Mississippi. And, and there were people that moved here that were going to churches of, the, of this type of thing. Oh, yeah, and then later on, not too many years after that, this church here decided to leave the conference and was independent. Uh, and so uh, we was with that for quite a number of years. But what about but we're that, not with that church anymore? But what about that background prepared you to respond in the way that you did? Well, you know, we were always taught you don't resist evil. Um, you know, you just uh, you just don't. And this issue has come up. What do you do when you're attacked? Suppose you'll be attacked. And the thing is kind of like left up in the air. Uh, people didn't seem to know. Because in reality, in the 20th century, our people have not been victims of any violent crimes. So it was just kind of a theory. Uh, that's pretty well what it was. But except you just don't to resist violent uh You don't... You don't fight back to kill. Definitely. That, I mean, that was a given. You don't kill, even to, in self-defense. And now, so now people talk about rape. Well, some people say you shouldn't even resist that. Now, I have something to say about that. That's personal. But now, for to prepare us for this particular thing, many years ago, when I was a young woman, and when this happened, I was 75. Today, I'm 76. I took stock of my situation. I'm less than five feet tall. Back then I was 4'11". Today I'm 4'10". And, and I knew if a male would ever attack me, I would be powerless to defend myself. And so I knew the only way that I could defend, uh, I could protect myself is I'm gonna do what I can. Uh, I'm gonna cooperate with God. And I'm going, and I knew what the Bible said about angels. And I knew what 1 Corinthians 11 said about angels. And so I'm going to cooperate with God. And if I ever experience any fear, I know I need to take some precautions. Otherwise, I'm going to depend totally on God to protect me. Totally. Because I'm totally powerless to do anything. And so this was my mindset since I was a young woman. And so when this happened, God gave me, now what I did to him, I, I was not ignorant of that strategy. I was not ignorant of that. But that is what I did. But the fact that I was able to take that knife away from a man that is six foot tall, 35 years old, and who worked out, it's impossible for a young, for an old lady like me to take a knife away from him. And God intervened. And so you see, and I did not live in fear. I didn't for my well-being. I could go here to the arm. I just did not live in fear at all for my well-being. Because I was trusting God to take care of me. Because I couldn't do it myself. I'm help I'm totally helpless. And God showed up. <laughs> In a beautiful way. And you know, and the fact that he showed up and did what he did, I don't think I realized it, the, the, uh, the, um, the awesomeness of it until afterwards. Because this, knowing this and thinking about it, it fills me with so much joy. It prevents me from being traumatized. I have never experienced any trauma because of it. And I have, I did cry one time. I was having my own personal devotions, uh, doing Bible study and praying. And I got to thinking about this again. And, and there's one thing, when I do think about it, there's a, at one point, I can think what could have been, what could have been if I had not taken the knife away. But I always stop. No use imagining, none at all. But anyways, I was thinking about this whole thing. I was reliving it. Now, I promise you, the trauma, I said trauma. This was a violent act that we were experiencing. It was violent. How I saw how God intervened on my our behalf. I felt so grateful. I was so awed how God showed up 
and he helped us out. And I had to cry <laughs> because it was so beautiful. It was just so awesome. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when God does a miracle like that, you can't be traumatized. Right. You can't be just experience a lot of joy. So tell me a little bit more about how God showed up. Well, for one thing, okay, God showed up, okay, I took the, okay, he knocked Roland, J Mar, his name is J. Mar Stallings, that's the name of the offender. He knocked Roland out. We did not connect the dots until later. He knocked him out, he pushed him off on the floor, and it wasn't, and he was out of it. And then when he started coming to, he was distracted from me. Mm -hmm. It was in that second, he was over here. I took that knife out of his hand. It's like he gave it to me. And I was, and while he was scolding him and threatening him, I found a place and put that knife and I hid it. So when he came back, he never asked for it. <laughs> and he walked out of here without it. And uh, so God showed up. I guess at the time, I probably didn't realize it until a little bit later. We were in survival mode. We did not want to be murdered. And when I think about how awful it would be mm -hmm. to have been stabbed, to, you know, that, that is frightening. But, you know, I can't let my imagination go there because God protected us from that. So it was, like I said, it was until later that we I connected the dots on this. This was God doing it. So didn't also God remind you of scriptures or of things to think about in your situation? Only thing at the time is that I was just warning him that he needs to repent or he's going to hell. Mm -hmm. And I, as far as any other scripture coming along, the only thing was is when I opened my eyes and I saw that it was just so black, so black. Power, I'm dealing with the power of dark. And then I knew what the scripture says, how the devil is power of dark. I mean, he's, that, that said, the power of darkness. He's a power. I was dealing with the power and, and the power of darkness. That is when I, that's when the scripture, and then that was why then I, and I knew the blood of Jesus would deliver us from the power of darkness. That is the only one. As far as any other verse, our Lord can take care of it. There was nothing like that on my mind. So does the um, power of darkness and demonic um, presence or possession, does that, is that kind of a little bit far afield from uh, traditional uh, uh, Mennonite uh, thinking? Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if I've heard a sermon on how to deal with demons. I really don't know. You know, it doesn't mean we didn't hear it. I just don't, I, I've read about it. I have read um, bo a booklet on pleading the blood. And I've heard about that when I was a young child. But I don't remember hearing a sermon on it. I really don't. But I knew the power of blood, of the blood of Jesus to cleanse us. And how that, how uh, the devil's hold was broken because of it. I knew that. But as far as hearing any sermons from the pulpit on this particular issue, I, I don't remember. <coughs> I don't remember hearing one. Mm -hmm. It's maybe too Pentecostal. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. No, that's fine. So um, you told me on the phone that you couldn't feel traumatized about this. Tell me about this. You, and you can phrase it in your own words. I I couldn't feel traumatized about this because. Yes, it's when I realized how God delivered me. And I am always filled with so much pleasure and joy and delight that you can't, you can't feel sorry for yourself. You can't be traumatized because I just go off in another direction and that is pleasure and joy. Does that make sense? It is a, it's totally opposite from being grieved and uh, being angry. I don't know if I was angry. And you know, the upshot of this whole thing is 
after we had shared our story through different media, uh, a lot of people have talked to us, the public. They're not Mennonites, but the public, they are probably Baptists. I just use that as a catch-all term for be the Methodist or Baptist or Presbyterian, don't matter. Um, they, they're awed with what God did. They're horrified to start with, and when they hear how God delivered me, they're just, wow. And they say, I never heard anything like that before. I say, I didn't either. <laughs> and, you know, it is so gratifying to me to see how people are blessed. And, you know, we live our lives and we just, it's so routine and we kind of fly under the radar and uh, we just have our work and we just go about our business every day and wonder what are we doing for the Lord? Is it worthwhile or anything? But this event, God, God allowed it. That's the thing. God allowed it to bring honor and glory to him. And we didn't benefit anything from him. He, if you'd see a picture of what he looked like, he looked terrible. Uh, he was all beat up and bruised up, and uh, I had bruises too, and um, tooth was knocked loose, but uh, we healed up well. But it was this whole thing brought me people think about God. And we people told us that. This, this makes us think about God. And how can you feel traumatized when you know that people are thinking about God? Something bad. Now, it's a good thing God didn't ask us to do it because we acted spontaneously. Uh, we didn't plan how we were. I mean, this was not planned. Because imagine being in a deep sleep and all of a sudden here you're attacked. You can't plan how, you're gonna, how this thing's going to turn out. You didn't know that. So what would you tell another woman who maybe has, maybe actually was raped and maybe was traumatized? What would you tell her? That is a good question. I don't know. Um, I guess I would feel like if God allowed it to happen, what you need to do, step back a little bit, get, get right with the Lord, walk with him. That is what you need to do to prepare for whatever happens. And get and then take this thing to the Lord. Take this thing to the Lord. Tell him how you feel. And don't leave until you get satisfaction from God. Is that, that's, not a, that's not a very biblical term, is it? Until you feel like God has heard you and he has spoken to your spirit or soul. So did, did, at any moment, did you, did you feel or think or sense, have you thought, I didn't do anything to deserve this or to cause this. This was his evil, his issue. I don't think I did anything to deserve it. I think this is ordained by God. I told somebody now I know why I'm short. Because <laughs> <laughs> this guy was six foot tall and I'm less than five. And uh, I don't have any cousins short as me. <laughs> and uh, I think God had this, God allowed this. To show his power, his majesty, his glory, and to make people think about God. He allowed it, but he cut it short. That's when he showed up. I think he was there. I think there was an angel there all the time. I didn't see an angel, though. But he, he was, God was supervising this. Mm -hmm. I'm confident of that. So do you think that, that other people who have been through similar or maybe worse can learn something from your from your situation uh, or story. Okay, uh, maybe I should say this too. Uh, we had a 25 year old daughter that uh, succumbed to glioblastoma. That is a brain cancer, it killed her. And when we found, when I found out, when the, her doctor told me that she has only a short time to live, I cried hard for two days, I cried hard. And I decided I'm gonna have to have this thing out with God. At the time I was with her, with her and her husband, my granddaughter, he was 700 miles down the road. And so I spent time with the Lord on that. I didn't even have the faith of a mustard seed that God would heal her. But spending time with the Lord, I became away from that. I got peace. 
I knew if God were to call her home, he would be there to comfort me. But in the meantime, live life to the full each and every day. And I did that. I never was tra traumatized since then. When she did that, what God did that night, she died in the afternoon, and Ronald was here in Mississippi. I was in Indiana. And that night when I went to bed, the Lord did something special. He gave me a, I don't know what you want to call it, vision, memory, waking up my memories from Regina, that was her name, our daughter's name was Regina, from the time she was born, and I was seeing her life all the way up to the time she did. It was like I was seeing a video, a movie of her life, and I was filled with so much joy that God had loaned her to us these many years. And I knew then that she was alone, and if it's done, it's time to go home. And we were blessed with her presence for a short period of time. So, 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 would, so would you say that, that looking at situations in life with an open hand is a, is a lesson to be learned? Yes. Uh, if you have a loved one, not a child, I mean, parents, do not expect to bury their children. They expect the children to bury the parent. That's just normal. And, but here was a young woman in the prime of her life with two little children. And uh, so this is all in God's hand and we need to realize that, recognize that. And so, and these children are gifts of God. I mean, they have loaned them to us and how they, and we, yeah. She was ready to go. And so how can I be traumatized? Sure, I cried, but I I cried hardest when I found out that she might not survive mm -hmm. months before. So do you think that that experience maybe prepared you for an open-handed experience with this rape? I think rape? so, yes, sir. Uh, because you, if you walk with the Lord, you know, he, things are in his hand. And you just roll with it. <laughs> you want to say it that way? Um, you just have to accept that you can't change it. Mm -hmm. You can't change it. I couldn't make Regina survive that cancer. She had the most deadly form of cancer there is. And, and this Jamar, he had a deadly weapon, and I was able to take that away from him. And he could easily have murdered us. He could have killed us both. And our police chief, where Megan said he could either have been dealing with a murder case, and it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So what? What? What if? What if the rape had gone through, and what if he had murdered one or both of you? Then what? You know, I don't go there. Uh, what I did to his genitals, he couldn't do it. <laughs> he couldn't do it. I was hanging on for dear life. There's no way in the world he could do it. Fortunately, I was a married woman. <laughs> I knew a little bit about male anatomy, but anyways, uh, he, he couldn't do it. There's just no way in the world he could do it. And, uh, but murder, uh, you see, I don't go there because my med I've got a vivid imagination and God protects me from that. He doesn't want me to go there. So that's, that is imagination. It didn't happen. Be thankful for what did happen and praise the Lord for that. Excellent. That's the way it is with Regina when she died. Well, um, you know, I and I thought, well, you know, I would I have something to share with people who lose their children or something and they grieve deeply and I share my story and I think too many people want to stay mad at God. I have surmised that. They want to stay mad at God. For some reason, get a certain satisfaction out of that. I don't get it. Because you can't change it. You can get mad at God, and you're not, he, he's, she's not going to come alive and resurrect, so I won't be mad. <laughs> uh, just be thankful well, I had her this long. There are some mothers that never had a daughter. I had one with four, we had four brothers. <laughs> so, but God was good. Sure, I miss her. I've missed her. I shed a few tears, but I never was mad at God. Mm -hmm. So with this potential rape situation, this happened when? On July 7th in 2022. Okay. 
And we don't know what time it was. It probably was after mid. I don't know, it was about midnight, because we looked at the clock, it said 11, 11, and we, I didn't even have the presence of mind to look to see what time this was when I woke up and saw Tamar. When he was t asking me to not tell the police, I decided I wasn't going to tell him the untruth. And I didn't tell him I would, I didn't tell him I wouldn't. Finally, I told him this. I said, we'll do for you what, whatever we think is the best for you. And he was satisfied with that. He didn't ask again. I asked him, how did you get in this house? The doors are all locked. I broke some glass. Come, I'll show you. So I followed him all the way through the house. He broke that door over there. And in the meantime, she called 911. She got a hold of my phone and called 911 when he was walking through the house. So what happened next? Wow, again, this story is just really shocking to me that this uh, 70, mid-70s couple really went through the mill and very traumatic details. But we have to take another break, so we'll be right back. Hello, this is Timothy L. Price with Kingdom Citizenship, and today I'd like to talk to you about another book that's going to be encouraging and inspiring to you. Now, no doubt that people all over the place are wondering what in the world is going on in America today. Well, this book, The Coming Caesars, is a book that's going to tell you exactly what's going on and why it's going on. Now, I don't place too much hope in the politics today. In fact, I think it's going to disappoint everyone. But this book is going to give you an understanding why we need Kingdom Citizenship Podcast. And so get the book, get inspired, get encouraged, and realize the value that we have with Kingdom Citizenship Podcast. This is Tim with Kingdom Citizenship Podcast, and I want to talk to you for a minute about advertising. You know, this podcast is not cheap to put together, and so we want to offset the cost with advertising. Say if you make something, create something, or sell something, we can get together and put together a advertisement for you and put it up on the podcast on a regular basis. Let's get together and see how we can help you make some money. Okay, we're back for the final segment that's going to be actually quite lengthy, but I want to stay in my... Uh, typical pattern of uh, commercial breaks, but if you would like, subscribe, share, and leave comments. You know, this story is quite amazing that uh, an older couple would experience these types of things, and quite possibly this story could be very encouraging to others to hear. So please, again, share it with other people. She called the police. 911. Yeah, 911. When the police come to the door here, well, I... Well, you, you came over here. Yeah, over the car carport door, garage door. Well, you, you forgot to tell them how he brought through here. Yeah, that's right. I come to, to this door here. I was barefooted. I stepped in there and I felt glass under my feet. I'm not going to go down farther. And I pled with him. I said, why don't you just leave? And he did that. He walked out that door and left. Didn't see him again. See, he had taken a concrete block and threw it through that glass. Door. Yeah, and then reached in and locked it. That's what he did. But when the police come, I buy them in, and they they said they brought an they got an ambulance out there. Well, and they they looked at me. They said, "You go out there. You get in that ambulance." I thought I could get in the car and drive <laughs> and drive to the hospital. It's only two blocks away. But, but I did what they said. I got over the ambulance, they put me on the stretcher. And then later she was got in there too. And up front. Yeah, and we, we told the police to come on in the house and they can inspect anything they want to inspect, you know, and examine. And she told them where the knife was, you know, they got that. They saw blood on the floor. You know, there was, but there's one thing that's very important on a situation like this. Don't go and destroy the evidence before the police get there. Make sure 
you, you don't destroy it. Leave it alone. Leave, leave everything alone. Mm -hmm. There are some cases where it would happen where, where it was destroyed and it's very tempered with it, it's it's very uh, frustrating to the police so now looking back on this was this embarrassing mm -hmm. we couldn't help but no as far as we one thing is different we we've been on a rape generally you don't when you hear stories of somebody being raped it, they don't seem to talk much about it uh, maybe the victim is threatened not to tell anybody. I don't know. Or they're so embarrassed, they don't want to talk about it. But we've all been very vocal about it. And and what we and she wrote the story up. And, and what I tell people, I'll tell people, this is something. It's This is nothing about the great things we did. It's what God did. That's what we want them to look at. Not what we did, but what God did. So what what has been the response? You said that there has been some interest. Yeah, well, people have told us this, told me too already, that this makes people think about God. Uh, I had a customer in my store just, just the other day uh, that lived in one part of the county. She, I know sometimes they hesitate how to say it, you know, but they want to bring the subject up. Uh, but anyhow, she told me that that she's been re reading this story all a number of times. And I told her how when, when we asked Jesus to, to get rid of this demon, it, it, it all appears like this demon left right then. You know, when Jesus was on this earth, he healed the sick, he healed the blind, he healed the lame, he cast out demons. But when you read a story about him casting out a demon, they're healed right then. It isn't a long process. They're completely healed immediately. And you know, that's just about the way this is. You know, it ain't, it ain't, we don't have any power to, to, to put this devil, this devil. It's a state, but Jesus does. He has the same power today as he did back there in the New Testament. So so you guys aren't closet charismatics, are you? Is that what you call it? We don't know what is that what you call that? Yeah, yeah. Charismatics that believe in uh, casting out demons and stuff like yeah. that. Well, well. <laughs> it's right in front of our face. How can you how can you help from believing something? <laughs> yeah, it was instantaneous. No. It, it was so sudden. He just Suddenly, just relax. It was just like that. I'm flipping the switch. <laughs> it wasn't a process. It wasn't a uh -huh. process. It was instantaneous. Uh -huh. But where did you learn that that this kind of thing would or could happen? About the demonic. Well, I have read charismatic literature way back. We have, and they talked about that, and. Uh, and some non-charismatic literature too. I remember we having a booklet about the power of the blood, and and he talked about using that in finding evil. And I have read also about the the occult and how you fight people who are possessed with the devil. And I don't know if I don't think that was charismatic. It was. I don't know what what church affiliation this writer had, and um, so it was by yeah, but it didn't interfere with our Mennonite. Well, we didn't talk much about it. We didn't have to. It's just something I just kind of knew, mm -hmm. and uh, but I knew what the Bible said about the part about the blood, how it overcome the evil of the devil with it, and. Um, I haven't thought about putting the blood in a long, long time. But so God put that in my mind. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, the power of the blood was there to save us from sins. In Revelation, there is a verse saying when Jesus returns, he'll fight the, well, he'll, he'll be fighting Satan 
with, by his name and, the, and also the, by his blood. Well, the people were, that were saved were saved because of that. Something like that. Yes. But, but in the New Testament, when Jesus was this earth, he did heal people that saved by the power of his blood because he didn't shed his blood yet. Excellent. Okay. So is there anything else that you would like to share with people about your situation or the fallout from it? The fallout, that would indicate there could have been some negative consequences? No, I mean, just the, the fallout, meaning what's happened since. Well, we have been given, okay, we were interviewed. Um, this happened during the middle of the night, and so WCBI TV from Columbus, Mississippi called us that day and asked us to interview us, and so they did. And um, of course, they used less than two minutes of that 25 minute interview that they recorded here. And so our picture was, went, oh, went to Nathan Circulated. County, mm -hmm. Columbus, uh, Tibble County, and who knows, Knox Street County. So when people, if we go to these cities, people recognize us and they will then ask us about it. And um, then after that, then the, we have our local weekly newspaper, and uh, Scott Boyd is the editor of it. So he called and asked if he can interview us. So he came and interviewed us here on a Sunday. And he wrote a big, long, lengthy piece, put it in the local paper, put it in the Columbus and Starkville paper, and he sent it to another news outlet in uh, Jackson. So if you were to Google Rollins Sandra Miller, uh, you would like to find the story somewhere. And then several months later, there was this fellow from Columbus went to Fairview Baptist Church, and he asked if he could come interview us. So he did that. He thought it needed a bigger, more exposure, and maybe more from a religious point, a biblical point of view, because the uh, WCBI kind of minimized that. Didn't say a whole lot about it. Uh, Scott Boyd, he. he talked about it too. It was an unusual story to say the least. I said story, you know, it's nothing we made up. I mean, you can't make this up. Um, so that got a lot of publicity. And then I put it on Facebook too. And then, oh, this Mr. Tippett, Kelly Tippett, who interviewed us. And he, and I don't know what all he did with it, but he did put it on YouTube. And he interviewed us about where we come from. And, there's two videos there, and uh, that's got some track. Uh, that got some views too. So, but, but now that's the public. As far as Mennonites is concerned, we hear very little. Very little. I th I don't know. That, I don't think they know how to handle it <laughs> because it's something that's not. It's almost unheard of among our circles. It's almost unheard of. And this is what I tell people. So if, if somebody asked me, you know, I'm kind of wondering if this is going to be, if it, we're going to see more of it. And I said, I think we will, because the Bible talks about in the last days. People are going to be more violent. going to be more lawlessness. I think we're going to see more of it. And so if nothing else, I think it's making people think and think that maybe they're, philosophy concerning non-resistance needs to be more realistic and biblical. And this is another thing too. This is what I tell people. I said, in the, on the Old Testament law, if a married woman was attacked by a bigot, if she did not cry out, she would have been stoned with the rapist because she would have been complicit. And so, you had to def you had to resist. If you want to save your hide, you had to resist. That's biblical. How many people know that? I, I dare say very few, unless they heard me talk about it. <laughs> but a lot of people don't understand that. I mean, God, I understand that's Old Testament law, but there's some things that are still applicable today too. And uh, immorality is just as wicked now as it was back then. That mm -hmm. didn't change. <clears throat> now, now then, <clears throat> the next night after this happened, 
for my children thought we should not go and sleep in the same bed. House. <laughs> or in the same house. So I have, we had a son that lives an hour away from here. And so we went to his house and, and we spent the night there. But then the next night we was back home again and we went slept. We, we went back to our bedroom. We stayed, we slept there. But one interesting thing was when we went back to our bedroom to sleep there, we really had no fear. Later we got to thinking, really, we should have had fear. But it didn't seem like we had fear. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, maybe the Lord just took care of that. We didn't. Uh, of course, at that point, they still hadn't rested. It took about four days till they rested the land, till they found him. But uh, uh, then later I got to thinking about this too. Everything he did to us, should you know, the natural thing should not hate him but I didn't feel no hate I didn't feel like I really hated him but I can say this I didn't really have a brotherly love for him now. <laughs> so, so why didn't you why don't you feel that you had a or why do you feel that you didn't have uh, an anger or a hate towards him well that's that's what I wondered too my concern, I was kind of preaching to him that he needs to search. He needs to find the Lord. You know, I put was putting emphasis on that. You know, but uh, I don't know if he heard me or not. I don't know. He didn't pay no attention. He didn't make no remark about anything like that and what she said. But, but people. I, I'm not sure why. I, I felt, exactly felt that way. Uh, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> is it different? You know, when a person comes to Christian, he's he's supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, and Jesus told his disciples when they left, you know, when the spirit the, the Spirit's going to come. And he says, you're going to be in front of rulers and and tyrants and be persecuted or or whatever. He said, don't plan what you're going to say. You just the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. So I thought, well, maybe that's what was happening to us. I really don't have any other good answer. You were looking, though, for God to provide. I guess that's what well, really we acted happened. spontaneously. Because I also cried. To, we was at one point there, and I thought he was going to treat her pretty rough. I didn't know. he. I was afraid maybe he was going to start beating her in the head. But he really didn't. Well, he did hit me. He did one time. And so I find I just was crying to Jesus to come and help us. I didn't say the word anything about the word blood. She did. But I was asking Jesus in his name to come, just to come help us because I didn't have no way to turn to. If I'd got up, he'd kill me. And I knew if, if I'd be dead, I couldn't help her. So all I could do is just stay there. You know. Wow. Uh, but now he had the potential to kill somebody. So after all this, after I told him that we'll do the best for him that we can, and I know, and I know my definition is better to him, better, different than his, but the best thing for him is to get him off the streets because he has the potential to go to do it again. And next time, he may kill somebody. And if he kills somebody, he'll be a whole lot worse off than he is now. Or somebody will kill him. Because I, not many people told me this, but one person told me, if something like that would come to my house, I'd, I got a gun on both sides of the bed, I'd shoot him. And he'd be dead meat. Well, if I'd had a gun there, there is, and the way he approached it, there's no way a gun would have done us any good. If I had a gun there, he probably took it away from me and I'd be the dead man, you know. Uh, you know, the, the way he approached us, uh, there's, there, there's no way. The best thing in that situation was not to have a gun there. This way, we're all alive. He, he walked away with, uh, with hardly, with a, not even a scratch. Okay, folks. Wow, that is a really amazing story again, I thought. And I hope that you enjoy this sort of thing. You know, with Kingdom Citizenship, several of the things that we want to do is 
number one interviews, testimonies like this one, and then eventually we'll get to some teachings and some things that are gonna encourage you that are more long form and more um, relating a specific detail that's going to help you learn to be uh, kingdom citizens. So anyways, uh, thank you for listening to this little bit longer interview or testimony. And I look forward to more people signing up with us and spreading the word about what we're doing. So we'll talk to you next time on Kingdom Citizenship Podcast. Thanks so much.